Edgar and I are here to, um, to describe data joint. Uh, so it's a framework for creating data pipelines for anything, but primarily for neuroscience, for the science lab. So we represent our company so, uh, here in this presentation, but we're also researchers in Andreas Tolius's lab at Baylor College of Medicine, and this is where everything started. So I've been in the lab for, quite, uh, for about nine years now, and um, Edgar is a graduate student getting ready to graduate. So we, we are involved in experiments, analysis of results, and modeling every day. And so this is our, this is our work. We have been using data join for empirical experiments and modeling for many years and started a company when we applied for a SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Grant, and they decided to fund it and we decided to try this. So, so right away to the we named the company Vates or Vates in Greek means deep. This is for deep data, deep deep learning, machine learning. But um, so this is uh, this is our company. So we're entering a, a, an age of very data rich neuroscience. So new recordings for neuroscience produce immense amounts of data. So for example, in a typical two photon experiment a few years ago, we would record from a few dozen cells at a time, and, uh, and so this is the result of pixel-wise analysis of orientation tuning or tuning to, uh, to motion. And thanks in part to techniques developed here at Genelia, uh, we record from thousands of cells at the same time. So this is, uh, this is recent. So, but the size of the data is not the only problem. It's probably, the, if, if it was the only problem, we would just buy more hard drives and we would be done. So the number of recording modalities also keeps increasing. So and the complexity of experiments keeps increasing, and this is this is where this is the di difficult part. So in this um, figure, uh, this figure is from our 2014 study. So in our experiments, we combine two types of two-photon imaging from a resonance scanner and acousto-optic deflector-based uh, uh, microscope, and also included uh, intracellular and intracellular electrophysiology, uh, molecular labeling of cells, visual simulation, stimulation, video recordings of behavior and eye movements, so all was synchronized in, in the same experiments. And so uh, Jacob Riemer was the, the first author. He, he was running experiments and he found a particular relationship between intracellular membrane potential and eye pupil dilation. And it was exciting, so he saw, he saw this relationship, so he quickly mobilized the lab. We had been using data joint for several years now. So we all jumped, we did a lot more experiments, did a lot more analysis, and uh, were able to go from the initial glimpse of that finding to a submission in, in a, just a few months. And so because we're all using data joint, we're, we're very quickly able to mobilize very quickly. So recently, our lab became involved in uh, the MICRONS project. So it stands for Machine Intelligence from Cortical Networks. It's funded by the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agencies, uh, Agency. Um, it involves many institutions, probably 20 different institutions. And its stated goal is to revolutionize machine learning by reverse engineering al algorithms of the brain. And it, on the empirical side, it involves large-scale detailed fun functional characterization of large volumes of tissue and also linking that to detailed studies of connectomics, the connectomics of the same tissues. So it's, um, it's distributed between many teams. So sharing data, sharing pipelines of data became very important. We came ready with data joint because we had been using it in the lab for, for a while. So it includes a lot of experiment, analysis, and modeling as well for the machine learning part of the project. So these are the challenges that data joint helps address most effectively compared to other solutions. And we will re revisit them throughout the presentation. So collaboration, so it's still very common in many labs that we that like in, at Baylor, for example, where each member of the lab does their own work. They, you know, they guard their data and share. Sharing means just at the end of your analysis, posting it somewhere on Google Drive. For example, so it is still common, but more commonly and increasingly, there is separation of labor between members of the same lab or even between multiple labs. So immediate and concurrent access to the same data becomes very important. 
And so when a new person joins, joins a project or a new group joins a project, they need to immediately be integrated into the whole process. So that's what we mean by collaboration. So people must have concurrent access to the same data. So data and computation, a lot of the data that, that is part of the pipeline is not acquired, it's computed. A lot of processing results, all sorts of deconvolutions, alignments, everything, uh, there's a lot of computation. And so we need to link and trace what code was used to generate the data just for transparency and for uh, to be able to, for data integrity <clears throat> and so and continuous exploration so we cannot wait until we're happy with one step of analysis before we move on to the next uh, like one example is uh, segmentation like are you ever happy with your segmentation into photon imaging it keeps keeps improving so we cannot, so one solution a, a lab or a project might decide, let's really design the best algorithm and so that we can move on to the next step. But it doesn't work that way. It keeps improving, keep, things keep changing. So we need to be able to adopt and to introduce new techniques even, even after we've moved on uh, simultaneously developing the, the next steps in the pipeline. So what's a pipeline? So a, a data pipeline is a sequence of steps for data entry, acquisition, processing, and analysis with integrated uh, storage, data storage at each step. So as a running example, I will use two-photon imaging because it's something we do a lot and I think a lot of you do as well. So we'll use a simple scenario, a simplified two-photon imaging scenario. So in the initial uh, portion of the pipeline, so this is the very start of the pipeline, the, uh, the pipeline plays the role of uh, the lab book for entering experiments. So if, when we get a mouse in the lab, whether it's bought or if it's born in the lab, it's assigned an ID and we, we enter all the information directly into the pipeline. And then uh, if we perform a two-photon session experiment, so session here means a two-photon imaging session, like a single, single day of imaging. <clears throat> That's a session. We enter information about the session. That may involve the setup, the anesthesia that was used, uh, any, any details about that session. And then within each session, there are multiple scans, movies of, for example, calcium activity or structural imaging. So that's the, that's the start of the pipeline. Underneath the each, is, each node is a table. It's a simple uh, table. And so the, these initial nodes, experimenters can enter into information into them in the form of a spreadsheet or a form and so this this is entered during the experiment so once the inf this information the manual information so we call kind of, we call this manual manual steps automated processing can begin and so the pipeline proceeds to to automated uh, steps and you see that the notation kind of changed for the nodes so we proceed with alignment so this is to compensate for any ar artifacts of a raster if it's a raster microscope Segmentation of cells or whatever we're imaging to identify the regions of interest. Extraction of traces, for example, calcium activity traces. And uh, once we link the traces to the stimulus, uh, say visual stimulus that was presented to the mouse, we can characterize the cells and their responses. And that's the uh, uh, RF or receptive field uh, computation. So we use, we use this, so data joint, we distinguish into several, into each node into several tiers. So lookup is a lookup node can contain general facts that are not specific to any particular experiments. This may, in this case, for example, the segmentation the segmentation method is a lookup table. It specifies many ways to segment cells or regions of interest. Manual is the information that comes from external sources that is entered, entered during the experiment. Imported, is, uh, imported and computed are both automatically computed nodes, but imported uses information from outside, from raw data, for example, whereas uh, computed only takes data that's already in the database. So it can work completely autonomous. So of course, and, uh, behind the scenes, each of these is a simple table. And um, you may know this uh, uh, computer scientist among you that the, this principle of breaking up data into a collection of simple tables is called the relational data model. So everything, everything is stored in these tables and becomes directly accessible. So there's no longer 
loading from files, parsing, you access the data from Python, for example, or MATLAB, and, and it becomes available in the workspace of, of your language. So you don't need to open files or read them. So, so what is DataJoint? So we'll get to the specifics. So we developed it, started developing it about 2009, and the lab switched around 2010 to organize their entire data, electrophysiology, everything, um, two-photon imaging, monkey and mouse, um, and then later molecular, to, uh, based on DataJoint. So it's a free and open source uh, library for MATLAB, uh, and later Python was added. Now Python is as advanced or more advanced than, than MATLAB, but it started as a MATLAB library. It actually enhances the relational data model. So, um, so we've used it in the lab, and, and then we made it open source around 2011, and some, some labs adopted it without even us knowing, which was great. And then it spread to other labs. We, we've been writing it for ourselves, so one, and, and teaching people who work with us. So since we got the grant to start the company, our goal now is to make it so that other people can adopt it as well, so the, which means good tutorials and documentation. Because until now, we have been, we have been writing it, so we didn't, need to, didn't have the need to develop good tutorials, good documentation. So now this is our primary focus to quickly catch up on that. So the way it works is uh, you, there is a centralized, so if you, if you set up a lab to use DataJoint as their primary tool for organizing uh, data, you will set up a, a server. And then, uh, so it's a centralized data management system. And then uh, everybody from their computers or from systems um, that they use for experiments can interact with the data without conflict uh, concurrently. So it, the, it may start small. So the server can, you can start small, you can start it on your laptop, and people will connect to your laptop, or you can just do everything on your laptop. They can, you can set up a server, uh, lab-wide server, or then if you, if you collaborate with multiple labs, you can set up, set up a server in the cloud, so multiple labs can work together on the same data. So there are a lot of initiatives for sharing data. <coughs> DataJoint is not designed specifically for data sharing. Data sharing kind of comes for free. So a lot of people, so there are a lot of initiatives to, to create a tool for uploading, making data available once you're done with it, once you process everything acquired. A pipeline is, it becomes, it replaces those steps. It becomes part of those steps. It's, it's where you start with your, putting your notes as you run the experiment, do the acquisition, do the, uh, uh, pre-processing and analysis as part of the entire pipeline. And then data sharing comes for free. All you, all you need to do to share data is give access, give a username and password to somebody and they can access the same data. So the data become immediately shareable and no extra work is required to, for, the, for the sharing part. If you're looking for the tool to put your deposit your data after you're done with it, um, you can use DataJoin, but DataJoin is primarily designed for constructing active working pipelines. And so the pipeline defines your workflow by, so if I, if I join a project that uses data joint, I will immediately produce this type of diagram to, and it immediately becomes apparent to me what's going on. The structure of the project is, becomes avail, uh, visualizable. So let's get back to our uh, two photon pipeline and examine how it's defined and how it works. So the first node, as you remember, was the mouse. So we define uh, the table either in MATLAB or Python. So this is kind of how you define the, t uh, the table. You define the heading of the table, basically you declare what, what columns that table will have. And it's, it's separated by this line. So whatever is above the line is called the primary key. That is what you, is used to identify things in that table. So in this particular case, it's a mouse ID. So as soon as we ha get a mouse in the lab, we give it a unique ID, and it, it has that ID for the rest of its life. Short but eventful life. <laughs> and so, um, and, and then date of birth and sex, or uh, actually we have a lot more, of course. This is just simplifying. And so then you get a table that looks like this. It's empty right now, and a node in the, in the pipeline. So, so you specify this string, either MATLAB or Python, and then within a class that co corresponds to that table. 
the name of the table become the name of the class becomes the name of the table and these become become the columns of the table and so you you get this table sub in the database and, and you use that class to interact with that table so that becomes your first node so and then you can insert so since this is a manual table you can have a web interface to enter the data uh, you can use third-party software that provides a GUI you can develop a web app or mobile app to enter the data and then um, or from MATLAB or Python you would use something like this your mouse class you insert and then you insert the one row in the table so after executing this you would get this in the table you can do it in in a different ways for example you could explicitly specify in a structure you can explicitly specify the the names of the attributes before you insert and so you insert a structure with named attributes so that's that's the primary way of entering the data so we we enter more data we get we keep going we get more and more mice so we have 10,000 15,000 entries in the mouse database in our in our lab um, so we continue to the next uh, node which is session and so we define a similar class with a similar string that defines the structure the heading of this table and you'll notice something different it has this arrow to the mouse and that's what defines this line this line is a dependency and so um, if you actually open the table you will see that it has um, it borrowed the, the primary key of the mouse so the the mouse primary key becomes part of the primary key of the two photon session and then we add another attribute to the primary key so now a session is identified by two things the mouse ID and the number of the session for that mouse so together they have to be unique but you can have multiple sessions for each mouse and then you have other things like session date what equipment was used what anesthesia was used and this actually is a little snippet from the real database and again the primary key is identified anything above the line and it it's usually anytime you produce a depiction of the of the table it will be somehow indicated like here it's indicated in black so that's the primary key so we move on to the next uh, node which is scan again we declare dependency on session and uh, so basically that means whatever identifies a session also helps identify a scan so the the ID of the session becomes part of the identity of, of a scan so you remember the the primary key of, of session was mouse ID and session and now we add one more attribute so a scan is identified as a mouse ID session and scan and then we add other non-primary attributes so and again you can you can enter more of these things and so this is what the code would look like in Ma in Python and in MATLAB it would look very similarly except it would be in multiple files since in MATLAB for each class you have to have a separate file. You go back so so T1 RL this is the kind of stuff that's a, some control vocabulary. So you can so here I simplified it and I I didn't but you can have a lookup table yeah. so in the real database we have a lookup table. So there's a separate lookup table, one of these gray asterisk things, that where you list all the possible values, and then instead of specifying brain area here as a, as a character array, you would have an arrow to the, so it will also be, look like this arrow. And that means that the values can only come from that table. And yeah, that's very common. Yeah, so varchar is variable, so uh, here these are used, uh, this is actually pulled from the real database, so this is what we picked. Um, so the brain area came from it says we table we define and we decided that it will be identified by 12 character up to 12 characters So to, when he says 12, it's up to 12. It's maximum of 12 yeah. So uh, this is what it would look like in Python. I'm not listing MATLAB We talked about integrity so data join performs a lot of integrity checks for you just automatically so so for example the pipeline ensures that all the entered data are consistent and complete. Data joint implements these checks and constraints to prevent any confusion or, or loss of data or incompleteness. So for example, and rather than explaining them, I think they should be intuitive. I will just ask you what, what, what you expect, what kind of behavior you would expect. So if this is the entire contents of mouse and session, mouse table and session table, 
would it be okay to insert insert to make this insert? Do you see any any problem with it? Yeah, we're inserting a mouse. And so this is this is a valid entry. Maybe the next question will be more difficult. So there is not there is nothing wrong with it. The everything verifies and checks out. And I'll show by counterexamples you will see when it does not. Everything um, so how about this one? Is this one is this one okay? Yeah, yeah, this one is not okay because we already have nine five oh eight. So duplicates are not allowed. So the, the idea of the primary key is that that the primary key for mouse, if you insert into mouse, this the, those attributes have to be unique. So it prevents those kind of um, misidentification or duplicates. So this is not okay. So if we delete, when we uh, uh, when we delete something, this is some uh, what a delete would be would look like. Python and MATLAB differ slightly. I kind of put them together so th this kind of looks something in between what MATLAB and Python would look like. So you have to look at the specific syntax, but this is just to illustrate. So we have to restrict. This is a restriction. So we restrict the mouse to a specific ID and then delete. So would this, would this work if I wanted to delete the mouse with the, with the uh, primary key of 9508? If this was the entire database. This will work just fine. It will ask you, okay, are you sure you want to erase the mouse? But it will, it will delete just fine. If you, uh, if you try this one to delete 9329, it will, also, it will also say, it will also warn you, but it will also tell you, are you sure? Because this will also cause the deletion of everything that depends on it with the same, with the same mouse ID. So this may involve a lot of processing, a lot of data. So all the deletes will cascade from whatever you delete it up in the hierarchy, everything that depends on it, on the specific subset of the data that you're deleting, will also be deleted. You'll get a very detailed prompt, here's what's getting deleted, and then are you sure? And so, so basically, what that ensures, these two operations, preventions of inserts that are, do not yet have data matching data upstream, and the de cascading of de deletions downstream, this ma makes sure that everything that you have downstream in the pipeline has all the complete matching information. It is impossible to have in the database something down below that is missing something up above in the hierarchy. So that's, that's the integrity. So if you, if you fix a bug somewhere, nothing buggy should, re should remain, should be deleted and recomputed. Here's another. Now we're looking, we're inserting into session. Should this insert be okay? It's, is it okay? It's not because we don't have a mouse here that has the number. So it does not, it forces you to enter all the information. So this is not, com this is not good. So how about this one? It's also not okay because we have, we already have 93292. Nine, and that's a duplicate. So the, the, these two fields together should not repeat. But, but this is OK, even though this is part of the primary key. Both have to be together, have to be unique. But separately, they, they, can, they don't have to be unique. So this is OK. So that does happen a lot. So the question is, what if we design it so that there is no, if there is no session as another attribute? And so that would, make that, that would mean that for every mouse, we can only have one session, because there is no way to distinguish them. So then you, can, you, you, have, you have to add it. And it's, there are two ways. The easy way is to drop. So basically, so the drop command uh, removes both the definition and the data. And then the next time you, you generate the pipeline, it defines the new pipeline with the correct attributes. But then you lose, you lose the existing data. So 
Uh, more uh, so initially when you do a lot of changes that's the proper that's the easy way of of designing your so that is the easy way to design the pipeline when there's little data in your pipeline so once you have a lot of data so so then if you add an attribute you can and it just it's a it's a more it's a multi-step process that takes a bit, a bit longer but yeah you can yeah yeah it is possible so then you you have to provide the default value for session for the existing data so you say for all the data up to now session will be one and then for for all the new entries you have to specify it all right so now we want to get the data so now it lives in the database and now we want to bring it back into matlab or python so this is where the fetch method comes so you can use fetch on your scan for example and this fetches everything and it comes back as a, a structure array in matlab or in python it will be a list of dictionaries or a numpy record array so whatever or there are many variations of this and you can you can get it in your favorite form so you can even join multiple tables together so this is a join so if you if you say here are my mice here are my scans if you multiply them together you get all the information from scans up to here and then you also get the matching information from mouse so you get everything in one all the matching data at once so that, that works if you have small, you have a little data. It does not work when you have a lot of data. So when you have a lot of data, you need to restrict your query to, to get exactly what you need. So you can use restriction. You've seen this before, this ampersand. This is a the restriction operator. You can restrict by some conditions. So in this, can, in this case, the condition is a bas basically a structure with a attribute value specified. So since it specifies mouse ID and you specify uh, a value, then this restriction will refer to a just one row or up to one row in, in the mouse table. And then you just say fetch and it re retrieves the one, the one row. This is how you address values. You just specify some of the attributes or a range of attributes. Or You can use the same restriction with the mouse ID on scan, but since for scan, the, the primary key is longer, this will now fetch multiple uh, rows. So, but they will all correspond to the, same, to the same mouse. So you're getting all the scans for that mouse. This is what this fetch will, that fetch command will do. So underneath, of course, it's translated into SQL and it's a fairly lengthy statement. So to get the specific scan, you would have to specify the full primary key of scan. So you would have to specify the mouse ID, the session, and the scan. And this is how you get the one scan, for the one specific scan. All right. So, so, so far, we kind of talked a little bit about how data integrity is ensured in, for manual data, where you actually edit and insert things by hand. The rest of the pipeline is computational. So the nodes look similar and they're all tables fundamentally they're the same but they implement additional functionality for automatic computation and and data integrity actually becomes more important and more stringent so for automatic computation and so when you run into scenarios like this and think of maybe in your pipeline or someone you know what, what happens in, in in these cases what, what kind of work do you have to do and this is where data join kind of excels and makes it very easy and straightforward. What, what kind of work do you have to do when, when you've already computed a bunch of things and you found an error? For example, when you specified the path to your raw data, you forgot to update it from, a pre, from another scan or from another experiment. And then you realize it. What, what kind of work will you need to do to, to, to fix that? Or if you change a, 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 comp, a parameter in a computation, for example, if you decided that for segmentation, uh, a smooth, smoother filter will work better. Uh, what kind of work do you need to do to introduce that change once you have lots of data downstream from there? And then, uh, so if you discover an, uh, a bug, for example, you, you found a bug in, in a trace, in trace computation, or what happens if a computation throws an error and interrupts? So I, I worked with another application before, before this, and so when we also did like this similar type of work and, and so uh, division by zero was thrown in the middle and, and you end up with 40 traces where there are 80 cells. And, and so, and the next time you run it, it says, okay, it's been done. So 
So, and if you don't catch that, you have an inconsistency in your data. We also have had another case where I reran the data, I, re I re imported the data once, and then I, I played with the parameters and imported, uh, ran the same code again, and imported the same data twice because it was just checking against all the parameters. So all of a sudden I ended up with 400 cells for one site, even though there are only 200, 200 cells. So it, so that th those are the kind of problems that data join completely avoids and actually makes it, makes impossible to, to happen. So I'll I'll show some examples. So let me let me show some some more things. So I think automated computation is a particular strength. So we define a new table the same way. Again, we declare dependency on scan. We define the the things that need to be computed for for. Um, so this is for motion alignment. So we, we might like to co compute motion correction and also the average frame for reference for the, for the next steps. And so dependency, uh, uh, so again it shows up as the next node. It's blue because it's automatically computed and it's, it has to get external data so it's an important node. So we, we get a table that with a heading that looks like this. It borrowed the primary key, it didn't add anything so that means that there is only one alignment for each scan. So the way uh, all computations work in data join, you just say align populate. You, you don't need to, to say anything else. If you want to do a distributed computation, you can do it on any number of nodes, and you have to just say, you know, reserve jobs. Just It's a setting in the populate. So it already automatically knows what needs to be computed and how. So how can this work? So if this was, if this was the contents of current contents of the, of the database for scan and alignment, what do you think should happen if when you call align populate? I, I only show the primary keys here. I don't show the, all the. So it already has an entry match, matching 9508, but is not does not have entries matching all the others. So what it does, it's a, it uses uses the table substream as the source of the primary keys for the for, for the jobs that need to be done. And so it will call a callback function for each missing node. So it basically knows what's missing. So every computed node knows what's missing from it. So you can, you can always tell it just do the things that you need to do. You define a, a callback function for each method that is given the key of from above, so the, the key value from above. It, it uses that key to fetch the data above. There should be a parenthesis. And then it... Um, it inserts it and uh, it computes the new values and inserts it into the database, into itself. And so this is, when you call populate, it will call for, e for each entry in scan, it will, it will call this, this function once and it will do its work and populate itself. Here's another case where a computed table now, it's, it's the same concept, there is no real difference, the only difference is where it goes to get its data, where instead of just inheriting depending on one table, it depends on two tables. It depends on alignment, so now that your scans have been aligned and you have all the motion-corrected movies. And you also have a segmentation method table, and it refers to both of them. So the idea of the segmentation method table is segmentation method. So when you get, when you get a new table, its primary key now has the primary key of scan but, or of alignment, and also the primary key of the segmentation method. So it, now it can accommodate for every segmentation method. It can accommodate you know, for every alignment, for any combination. It, it can perform all, all, every combination of them. And so when you, when you call populate, it will populate for each alignment, it will do the segmentation using each available method. And so, so the advantage of uh, populate of this, of this process is that we use the exact same command, the exact same process for all the computations in the lab pretty much. When a new student comes in, we say, this is what you do when you do computations. You, you define a new node, you override its uh, make tuples, and, and uh, you call populate, and everybody integrates it into the pipeline and it exe gets executed. So code and data are tied together, so you define the table in the same class where the computations are performed, so it kind of keeps it nice and close. And then, yeah? Yeah, it, it does not. So when you make a change, you delete. If you either create a new method, and so you have, and then when you get make tuples, you, you have a new segmentation method. You create a switch statement. You keep the old data and you, you introduce your new method. 
if you're overriding an existing method, you have to delete the data from. So if, if you made a change, that becomes official, gets accepted by the team, you delete the old data. And that will trigger the recomputation of everything else. So it, it becomes automatic that way. Does that make sense? So if, yeah, if you make a change and, and everybody likes it, you delete the old data. If they, don't, if they don't like it, you introduce a new segmentation method, and now you have both data sets. And you can override the key source and say, I want, I want this method applied to this subset of the data, and this method applied to this subset. So you have to customize. But yeah, does that answer it? And then, uh, so uh, of course, distributed computing. So you don't have to write anything special to distribute this to many nodes. You just have to run the same script on many computers in the cloud on a thousand nodes and they all take the next job to do and they will just do their work. So here's where maybe I'll answer some of the questions about what we, reinvent, uh, what we invented with this relational data model. So for example, once you have all your data, you can answer very complex questions fairly easily. So for example, think of a, how you would do if with the current, with whatever data sets you're using, if you had to find data similar to this for example, find all the two-photon scans that were performed on awake mice with a grading stimulus. So typically this involves checking Excel spreadsheets, checking uh, notes, maybe some code, and then writing a special procedure. If you, have, if you organize everything in a relational database, you can write an SQL script that will do something like this. In DataJoin, uh, the same thing looks like this for the... For the uh, schema for the pipeline that we just defined. You restrict the session by anesthesia, so you get all the sessions for the awake animal. You, you restrict the stimulus by the stimulus type for grading, and then you restrict scan by, by both of these, and you get all the scans with the session where they're awake and uh, the stimulus of grading. So by just imposing some constraints and some conventions, we're able to introduce kind of a, a, a new way of doing a relational operators in a, in, a, in, a more direct, uh, in a more direct way. So here's an example of um, an application within our pipeline. So the visual stimulus is part of the overall data pipeline for several of our schemas, but it's also a complete an application all, all within itself. So this, is, uh, this presents stimuli and records them and synchronizes with other modalities. The stimulus condition table specifies visual conditions that are presented to the mouse, and it has specialization. So it has kind of subtables, tables that specify uh, more details that are specific to that type of stimulus. And so these are all the possible stimuli that you can ever show to the mouse. A stimulus trial, ta the stimulus trial table records what stimulus was shown and when. And then it links back to the, to the scan, and then the sync is a computed table which synchronizes the, the timestamps of the trial to the timestamps of whatever other modality you're using. And then downstream from there, you have analysis that computes, for example, some sort of tuning or receptive field. And it combines the information from spikes with the synchronization and, and with the stimulus itself and computes receptive fields, and from one mouse we can get, we sometimes get three, four thousand receptive fields. So this is kind of one example. Uh, a recent example, Catherine Cadwell in our lab, is she's a molecular biologist, not a database programmer, but she designed this, is still work in progress in the, in the past two months, so this is pretty much a complete pipeline for a patch seek pipeline for a project she's leading with, uh, uh, in cooperation with the Karolinska Institute. So it looks complex because RNA sequencing from individual cells in patching experiments turns out to be difficult. And uh, the, the pipeline includes multiple genomes of mice and other species with annotated genes, billions of reads from the Illumina machines, and uh, followed by gene alignment and multiplexing. So she's still working on this. So, so data joint, of course, is open and uh, free and open source. You can get it here from both languages. And tutorials are, are up and coming. So there are several of them distributed. We're putting them together. And by, 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 by June, we're supposed to have it all uh, organized. So our, our milestones for our phase one project that is funded this year is 
to provide resources to other labs, primarily you know, computational and experimental labs, to build their own cus custom data join pipelines. So we, rather than just doing it for ourselves, we, we, we want to help others do the same thing. So the other milestone is to provide some starting points. So instead of starting from scratch, you, you have examples which you can pull together and kind of start already with a few working examples. So that's sometime this summer. And then milestone three, and that's kind of the foundation of our commercialization proposal, is to provide hosting services. So rather than you setting up your own server, which may require some effort, you sign up, or labs or, or groups of labs sign, sign up for us to organize and manage that, and yeah, we, we come into the picture. So they, they focus on the science and not on the administration. So we have a website, datajoint.io that is for this effort. So right now what, what we have there is just the general information about the software and the services. Coming soon is the, so cloud hosting, simple cloud hosting where you don't, uh, with simple services is available pretty soon. So if you don't want to set up your own server, want to work with us, you're welcome to contact us. And then we will be developing web interfaces. So to attract people to use our, our servers rather than their own, we'll provide nice features like being able to enter the data through forms and things like that, and to configure and monitor your computations. And then in the future, we will provide features through this website where you can assemble entire pipelines from existing pieces, from templates, and then networking exchange these pipelines between different groups, and, and also perform cloud computing. So instead of you setting up, running it on your laptop or on your server in your lab, you can click and say have this node computed and like every 20 minutes make sure everything is computed and that will be taken care of. So besides that project, we are of course we're open to consulting. So if somebody wants to start using data join, they will probably need some, some help. Uh, although a lot of labs started independently, um, so we've been in business for two months now, so, and a lot of labs have adopted it without, without any help. But, but we're definitely welcome to help. So this in includes uh, custom pipelines, that's the bread and butter, and then training the people who are working with it, and then providing cloud hosting and maybe configuration within your, within your lab. Developing any custom features, if any are required, and of course priority support. If you need any anything, anything is not working, we can help. And so w the big project that will I think will help a lot of labs, especially those who do not have big computational, a lot of computational expertise, is to have prepackaged pipelines. And this this is a lot of work because pipelines tend to to get very specific to the lab. If you use that specific modality, the pipeline will be a little bit different. So standard, standardization is very difficult. I don't know if you are aware of this problem, but, but it's very difficult to, to produce something that works for everybody. So we need to produce customizable templates that you can, you can select in what you need. And then you, they can be assembled and customized by each lab, but the labs don't have to design everything from scratch. So this is our team for now. We, we are also hiring and expanding. And uh, of course, over the eight years since creating and using DataJoint, a lot of people have contributed. Andreas Tolis uh, has been the PI in our lab, and it's that drive to organize and to have, to have everybody using a uniform process that made it possible. Then uh, uh, many people have contributed either by code, code or advice or, or a, lot of, a lot of help. And so for, for, the, uh, for this phase one project for the um, small business, we have this grant from DARPA. This is all I have, and if you have questions, I will be, I don't know if, if your question got addressed or, no, okay, I'll be happy, I'll be, I'll be very interested to know your opinion. All right, this is, this is all I have for now. Uh, any questions? Do that and then get something back out of it, and then it sort of goes back into data joint. Or 
that whole bit of Python code, can I just sort of live inside data join and basically can I sort of do my spot computations and everything? So whatever lives inside your make tuples, you have full control over that. Yeah. So we have, uh, yeah, we've. People have implemented things where it pushes to the cluster. Or we uh, we have not yet implemented that Spark but, compute, but yeah, but yeah. There, there's no limitations. Well, so well whatever we, that lives in make tuples, pretty much good to go. However, you like to compute. So, like one example would be like if this was say like machine learning algorithm that I've been training mm -hmm. using data join, like a key tuple in, in treats a particular hyperparameter configuration for my network, but everything inside is running in TensorFlow. Yeah, yeah, wow. It's cool. Where would this break if my blob is four gigabytes? So, so, so that's one thing. So, so yeah, yeah. the yeah, yeah. long long blob field is limited to four gigabytes or GB bytes. Uh, so we introduce a new data type. It's right now. So a lot of people requested for for bulk data. It's called external. So what the way it works um, is it actually stores data in non-relational store, um, but what, but it still completely follows the relational data model. So everything looks transparent. What it stores is just a hash of the data. And the data are stored. You, you configure it either as three storage or on on a file system. But when you delete all the propagation of dependencies, works exactly the same. So so you can store uh, exabytes of data in a single. It's only limited by by the, the external storage. Whatever the external whatever you decide device. to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, how does it stay with the like, That's your best. Ten million? You said ten million? Yeah, 10 million. yeah, ten million is not. It's not scaling yet. So, so ten million is is small compared to a lot of. So, we re recently ran into like real difficulties with say billions of reads. Um, from, so yeah, so, so, so yeah. in that case, fetching data is still quick. What is slow are things like aggregation of data. So the data are indexed. So when you want to get to a specific one that you need, it's fast. What is maybe slow is like, for example, counting how many of each read you have for each lane or things like that. So when you have to perform computations on that. But yeah, it's, they, there is no limit to the size. Well, the size of a table is, of the index is limited by the size of the disk. So, and it's, it's, uh, it's a tree, a B tree. Uh, so basically it's an index that very quickly gets to your data. So you can have billions of entries and, and 10 million is nothing. You yeah. can store millions of yeah. So, so most of most of the time, the limitation doesn't really come from how many you actually have in total. Like if at any one time you only work with one or hundred or thousand, it becomes not an issue because you, there's a very easy way to just directly fetch and do, uh, work with those particular data. Now, of course, if you have like a billions of tuples or billions of entry, and you want to simultaneously work with it, then pretty much any solution will always have the issue of the sheer size. But in itself, it is not. There's no fundamental limitations. This kind of follows up on the data conversation. When it comes to, I can understand the code like being a snapshot into something like GitHub. Like, let's say you publish data at yep. a particular point. Let's say Facebook comes out and you want to release the data. So you've got code that's providing the DAG, providing the way that you're actually moving about the computations. Um, there are going to be manual edits, though, like to the underlying data. And you guys are using pages, particularly if it's a service based um, system, so it's sitting up in the cloud. So, how do you? snapshot or version the data at particular times and then how do you deal with data collaboration in the sense that you want people to look at data at a particular point in time you may have moved on from there you might want to share some amount of code and data at some particular point in time with some collaborators but not others mm -hmm. so basically the whole distributed yeah um, yeah because there are, there are two questions no, okay, so there, there are a couple of ways we, we uh, address this. So for versioning, it's, you can add that mechanism. So for each table, you can define another primary key attribute, a version, a revision. And so when you change it, you increment it, and you have both data sets. You have, so you, you can discriminate be, be, between multiple versions of the same data. It's up to you to set that up. It's, it's a straightforward process. For, for access control, you can give, so this is more on the management side, database management, you can say, I want this person to have access to this portion of the pipeline. So the actual pipeline is split into schemas. So it spans multiple schemas. For example, our experimentalists don't have access to, to the computed part. The compute, computationalists don't have right access to the experimental part. So it's split into multiple 
stages. It could be, yeah. Well, so it could be as fine as like per table control. Yeah. But and it could be anywhere from like read writes, um, just being able to read it so you can view it, or you can actually insert it on new entries. So it could be very verified and control. Like for example, in our lab, every member has their distinct username for this service. So as a result, we can get set per user. We can uh, grant very, very specific access to which tables they can view, which tables they can manipulate, what kind of new tables and new computation they can add to the pipeline, so on and so forth. So how do you guys deal with external? It sounds like these are all uh, approaches that assume that you're basically operating on a database that stays there and you're using authorization and some other kind of additional keys to, yeah. to limit the access to the data to right. particular yeah. well, we'll But let's say you mm -hmm. actually want to transmit data remotely, that you actually want to export data. And it's sitting right now in your database. And potentially, like you're talking about now, blobs that could, could expand, and now you're using content cache keys into those stuff like that. So how do you then transport this external data as well as the stuff that you've got in your original database? So for, for now, the way we make data available, we give people access to our, so if we, we don't send data, we give access to people to fetch data. So we give them, if we need to duplicate the database somewhere else, that's a migration power or duplication synchronization process that's separate. But, but to share the data with somebody, we give them a username and password, access privileges to a portion of the pipeline, and give them, if they don't know how to use data we we'll give them the specific queries they need to issue. They basically always have to go back to the source. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we, can, we can mirror, so we have our internal database that we mirror to the cloud, so we synchronize it. That, that, so that's for the external users, but we keep our data inside, internal. You can, yeah, you can, you can set up those mechanisms. And this is where I think we can come in as a company to help, to help with that, um, with the, the server administration side of things, configuration. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.